thank you everyone for taking time this morning and joining us today. Um, when we speak about innovation, as Atit said, we are scared of the startup ecosystem. It's something that we're always thinking about, or we tend to think about a few very large uh, disruptive companies. But when we talk, but when we look at most uh, large organizations, innovation still tends to be uh, a challenge. So that's basically what we're going to try and address today in the next one hour we will try to present our perspective on how internal innovation capabilities can be built within uh, a large corporate organization. And we'll try to give you a few building blocks of what we think it takes to really build that uh, innovative organization. So to start off with, uh, you know, two things that all of us know first is that innovation is very critical for our survival and growth and secondly when we talk about innovation we are essentially uh, trying to say our ability to respond to change and when we say change we're talking about the changing customer preferences the evolving technology new competition coming in uh, and so on and so forth so when we look at some of the most innovative companies uh, across the globe, we realize that they're also the most, um, they're also the fastest growing companies. And uh, something about them is that they are driving a healthy mix of incremental transformative and even breakthrough innovation. Uh, across different areas. And if you take the example of Apple, uh, we know the iPad, uh, the iPod, the iPhone are absolutely disruptive uh, innovations that really, um, you know, challenge the market, but they have really been able to sustain those innovations uh, through a lot of incremental innovation. However, what happens with most organizations is that we, um, have a commitment to innovation, we want to take it up, but we are usually not satisfied with the outcomes. And uh, when we try to understand what are some of the most common challenges and from our experience of the organizations that we have been working with, we found a few to appear quite a lot. First is that we see the uh, companies not having uh, clear mechanisms to understand what are the themes or the areas or the problem statements that they really want to be working on. Secondly, if there is an innovation team or a particular business leader who uh, comes up with some uh, important areas, they're, they're not necessarily prioritized, they're not necessarily built as a very common uh, vision across the company, something that everyone's working towards. And uh, eventually, all of this leads to uh, not having an innovation pipeline that can uh, that is sufficient enough to invest in experiment and you know keep uh, making progress on that vision. The other two things that we also see is um, if, if companies come up with uh, good ideas, sometimes they uh, lack key capabilities or resources to really uh, test those ideas and understand, um, you know, how to actually take it forward. And there, the other thing is that we also see very slow or maybe not very decisive uh, decision making. So, yeah, so these are some of the common things that uh, we've been seeing. And now if we uh, look at this from an individual's perspective, so moving from an organization to an individual perspective, we see that within the two ecosystems, the startup and the um, internal ecosystem, we see start uh, an individual has much higher odds of success as an entrepreneur, maybe because of the focus that uh, he or she is able to give to the innovation project, the strong ecosystem, the mindset that uh, there is outside, uh, multiple factors. And when we try to dig a little deeper 
into this we we started to plot the startup ecosystem across the phases of the innovation journey so right from exploration uh, ideation to you know uh, revenue and scale and what we notice is that the startup ecosystem has um, has a support system across every stage of the innovation life cycle be it in the form of accelerators incubators uh, vc funds networking platforms and so on however when we start to plot uh, the innovation capabilities or the support system within a corporate across the innovation life cycle we see that most commonly there is a break in uh, the capabilities and uh, corporates tend to focus a lot on one or two phases of innovation so we've seen most organizations focus a lot on ideation maybe not so much in terms of exploration and then taking those ideas forward and that's really where um, innovation could die early hence a good way to look at innovation for corporates is to look at it in the form of a five stage innovation journey uh this is a very common journey and most innovation experts could be using uh slightly different words or different versions of it but in essence these are the five uh stages that we need to focus on when we think about innovation so uh the first phase is really the exploration stage where we develop a market hypothesis saying this is the future trend of my industry uh and this is something that is an opportunity for my organization and and uh getting that kind of alignment uh with the business leaders and then starting to pursue that throughout um the innovation journey so that's the exploration phase once you decide the areas that you want to focus on uh the uh the stage 2 is really about ideation so this is where uh you work with uh employees across units and try to discover the best possible way of either solving a problem or capturing a particular opportunity and also trying to validate if uh which solutions could be better or more effective than the other Once that is done we move on to the problem solution fit stage now this is really about building the solution and validating some very very critical hypothesis in the real world environment so uh this is where you start to interact with customers and see if if the solution is being effective and also that it is not just something that one customer wants but it's it's really an offering that could uh grow across uh the market and there is significant growth potential here uh the next phase is what we call the product market fit phase uh so once you have um a set of first customers at the problem solution fit, fit stage or uh, you could even have a first set of users you start to build a large enough base of customers and users who are willing to pay for your solution and finally you need to look at the revenue and scale uh phase which is um where you're trying to increase the customer loyalty and uh just in improve the efficiencies uh when we look at these phases we see that the role of the innovation team is uh very very dominant across the first four phases whereas stage 4 is where the hand off to the business team start to really happen and uh when we talk about uh these phases it's also very very important to link them to your innovation goals and what we mean by that is innovation goals can really be um met with incremental transformative and breakthrough innovation and once you start to break those things down uh you might want to take forward as an ideation exercise differently for incremental improvements versus big breakthrough ideas um the reason behind this is that um if you just look at the ideation phase employees could be uh, could very naturally come up with incremental improvements but breakthrough innovation will require a very different uh, way of thinking and hence uh, you might want to do that differently
so once that kind of a uh, uh, a journey is being looked at it is something that eases life not only for the uh, company but also for uh, employees uh, so every employee really knows that what is it that they are expected to do at each phase what is it that um, helps what is it that makes them say that my idea is ready now uh, to go to the next stage so uh, and this can be done through various uh, programs and as you go from one stage to the other the amount of resources be it in time or uh, the money that you invest keeps increasing so now that we've understood the very basis of what is it that we need to look at uh, we'll now move on to um, a framework which will help you understand uh, how is it that this thinking can really be translated into building innovation capabilities in your company so when we studied uh, companies and their innovation um, capabilities we were able to broadly um segregate them bucket them into four main uh, stages so the first one is innovation something that we call innovation as a concept so this is really where the uh, idea of innovation has just been in incepted within the organization and uh, there could be a few uh, people who are taking up in innovation initiatives but in a very bootstrapped and ad hoc manner what happens at the innovation as an activity phase is that the organization starts to realize that uh you know there could be uh, some potential in pursuing internal innovation and hence they start to commit to one or two programs and this could mean having a couple of events across the year so you might be running a hackathon or an innovation challenge um in a year the next phase really is that where the entire view that we've been talking about the innovation process is something that starts coming into play and the programs are really not looked at uh, separately as different programs but there is an entire uh, process that uh, connects the different programs together and there's an entire innovation pipeline that starts to be nurtured and finally what we say is the most uh, mature stage is innovation as a culture because innovation has now become so natural to the organization so it's it's not just a process it is something that every leader every employee really knows how to participate they understand the mechanisms and you've been able to uh, implement quite a few ideas and there is a huge portfolio of uh, innovation projects uh, uh that um the company has at this stage yeah now uh really thinking a little bit about that end state so what really happens when a company starts to um be at the state of culture of innovation so there are three main things that uh, traits that we can call uh, that we've seen across organizations so first is really we see very strong bottom up innovation mechanisms so um while top down innovation is something that is important and we will continue to stress on the role of leaders across the the entire innovation process uh, bottom up mechanisms really allow for an executive who does not have that kind of view or that kind of influence to be able to uh, participate in uh, the innovation activities and also be able to succeed with it and this really becomes the uh, ammunition for a company to be able to achieve their innovation goals the next thing that we see is the execution discipline so um innovation as we all know cannot be achieved in a short period of time and uh it requires multiple bets it requires a process it requires focus uh and also it requires a lot of accountability so most organizations who are at this uh 
state of innovation of cult, uh, innovation as a culture have been very very persistent uh, with their innovation efforts and they've uh, they're very uh, they also are um, they they measure the kind of output and our uh, hold teams accountable to the kind of output that is being delivered through the innovation uh, efforts that they are putting in lastly is uh, teams having entrepreneurial capabilities so uh, of course uh, we can have the mechanisms that are set in place and the processes however if the teams do not have the right uh, skill sets uh, to navigate the uncertainty that comes in with innovation then their likelihood of succeeding is not very high so that's the other thing that we have been able to see so just to give a um, view of what each of these traits could mean as behaviors or systems within the organization. Uh, so in terms of bottom up innovation, uh, employees are able to uh, independently make decisions. We see that there's a lot of deliberate sharing of information and uh, employees uh, really, as we say, bring soul to the game. So it's not just skin in the game, but really give it the all and bring soul to the game. Uh, in terms of execution uh, discipline, one is that there's a very, very clear strategic intent and vision, which is challenging the uh, employees and they want to work towards it. Uh, secondly, like we spoke about accountability, this accountability is also very time bound and uh, there are clear milestones as to how do you reach that uh, intent. Um, the decision making starts to be very, very def definitive. Um, so those are some of the things we see here. In terms of uh, entrepreneurial capabilities, we see uh, employees having very strong business acumen, being able to have a very good understanding of uh, customers and really be able to focus on innovation from a very, very uh, customer um, context lens. So now when we look at uh, the four stages and we want to um, you know build our capabilities and become a center uh, become a company that has the culture of innovation how do we really get there so what really are the building blocks so we have been able to identify four critical uh, building blocks that you need to keep working on to become a company that has a culture of innovation so the first uh, is the strategic intent uh, this really helps to understand where is it that uh, your leadership and the entire organization wants to focus on. It also helps solve for uh, commitment from um, the key personnel within the organization. Once you have that intent very clear and you have a commitment, there needs to be a process that is set in place to be able to deliver on that. And uh, this process includes the team uh, and how do you really create value and uh, uh, for uh, the organization. And uh, the only thing to keep in mind here is that um, we have to have the right processes in place and not the wrong processes. And they also need to be scalable and repeatable across the organization. Uh, having said that, processes by themselves are not going to be very effective without having enablers. So with internal innovation, our entire anchor is uh, to work with employees and their ability to contribute to innovation. So unless and until we are able to enable them, we're able to create that kind of an environment which encourages and uh, supports innovation, they would most likely not be be able to do justice to the process. So uh, process really helps you solve for the risk with innovation and enablers really help you give the freedom to employees. And finally, we have the innovation metrics. So as we all know, it's extremely important to look at the end outcome and value that is created. However, uh, metrics are also important to look at the uh, input and the kind of effort that's going in so that each of this commitment process and enablers can actually be iterated <coughs> to meet and improve our outcomes. 
So now what we'll do is we'll quickly get into each of these pillars a little bit. We'll tell you what the pillars are about and give you uh, a couple of illustrations uh, on each pillar. So the first one with strategic intent, we are really looking at uh, what are um, the areas that the innovation team or the innovation programs are focused on and how aligned are these programs to the business priorities. Also, are these incremental or focused on the current business priorities or are they uh, futuristic and um, look at transformative and breakthrough innovation? The next thing is uh, we look at resources. So resources is uh, not only in terms of the money that is committed to innovation programs, but also the time commitment uh, that comes in from leaders to support innovation programs and play an active role in it. And finally is the innovation sponsor. So here we try to look at the uh, level and the influence uh, of the primary sponsor of the program and their capability to take uh, the innovation forward. So uh, just looking at the innovation charter itself and how it evolves across the four stages. So first at innovation as a concept, we see that the focus is mainly on uh, making incremental improvements to the roadmap and the business commitment could um, not be very, very high. However, as you go towards innovation as a culture, you have a good mix of incremental transformative and breakthrough innovation. You've been able to demonstrate value and hence your partnerships with the business team are extremely, uh, they're well structured and uh, they have a very, very high interest in partnering with uh, innovation. Uh, as the um, commitment starts to increase from the business leaders, uh, we see that this impacts the innovation pipeline tremendously. So uh, if you initially started off with uh, you know, no exploration or no, um, say, focus or alignment on uh, what is it that you want to focus on, you'd most likely end up with a lot of ideas. Uh, and then only a few would be able to go to the next stage. And there could be very few that uh, are extremely scalable and work for the business. However, as this improves and uh, you are able to um, maybe have lesser idea, but ideas, but very focused um, on the areas that are really priority for your business today and in the future, uh, the, the um, conversion across the pipeline also improves and your ability to um, have new revenue streams and scale programs also uh, increases, scale projects also increases. The next pillar that we look at after strategic intent is a uh, process. So there are three key things that we need to look at in process. The first is the team. So is there a team uh, that is installed for innovation specifically? And what are the uh, key results expected from this team? Is it is it very focused on uh, executing a particular program or is it actually linked to implementing innovation and drive uh, delivering value to business? So that's one thing that we look at. The next is the life cycle stages. Are the programs uh, that you are running mapped across uh, the different life cycle stages and are they also catering to all the different types of innovation? And finally, uh, how much of a customer perspective are you able to bring in and how closely with the customer are you able to, uh, um, you know, ideate, validate and develop the entire uh, programs uh, product? So that's the customer perspective. So what we see is usually uh, when a company is at the innovation as a, as a concept stage, we see um, the programs could be very focused on just ideation. But as uh, we move towards innovation as a culture, the, um, the programs are spread well across all the four uh, stages of uh, innovation with all the four stages of innovation. And finally, at the product market fit stage, there's a good handoff to business teams. Looking at uh, the customer perspective, we're always talking about customer perspective, but how do we really bring it in across the different stages of innovation? 
so at the exploration stage it's very important to at at least a high level um have clear insights on what the customer pain points are and uh what are some of the changing trends in the world that could uh, impact their preferences uh in the future the next is uh, at the ideation stage you want to enable teams uh with data or uh ways they can gather evidence to validate that whatever solution that they are coming up with is going to be something that works for the customer the at the problem solution fit stage uh, a lot of this could be actual uh, customer interactions where uh, there is clear tracking of uh, the customer behavior as well as there is data where the teams are able to prove that um, you know, the user base or the customer base can actually go up at the product market fit stage um it it is is really about tracking a lot of quantitative information about the customer where you're looking at uh, the acquisition numbers the uh, retention how quickly you're able to renew and with revenue and scale you're really looking at uh, how loyal the customer uh, you're able to keep the customer moving on to enablers uh, when we look at enablers we're mainly looking at four things first is the employee value proposition so um how how inviting is innovation to employees within your organization and uh uh what is it that happens if they do well or what is it that happens if they fail so that's employee value proposition learning and development is really about how uh, are there specific curriculums that focus on um uh helping teams navigate this uncertainty across uh, innovation stages when we look at functional policies are there finance mechanisms are there hr mechanisms that uh, really help them give time or if they want to prototype something do they have something like a fund uh, available so uh, those are some of the functional policies and finally is there physical and digital infrastructure really available that they can leverage across the innovation stages just to look a little bit at employee value proposition one of the most common things that we see across companies is the rewards and recognition program and uh when we talk about innovation it is really about bringing innovation into uh the rewards and recognition programs and this could be um any kind of peer rec recognition it's very popular as well as any kind of prize money or award money after any kind of innovation uh challenge or event uh however something that becomes very important if, especially you're looking at high value innovations is uh to give propositions like um promotions or career acceleration opportunities or bonuses to employees um there's a good example of an automotive company where if uh this uh, the team's innovation reaches a particular stage gate and this is related to breakthrough innovation they are uh they get one year's uh salary as a bonus um now when we look at learning and development again something very important to link to every stage of the innovation process so at the exploration stage it's helpful uh, when teams are dabbling with design thinking and they are getting introduced to the idea of breakthrough innovation or what the future of the business uh, or the future of the industry holds um so um it really helps them understand what could really pain points be and what is it that they need to think about in terms of the ideation phase uh, they need to develop very very strong context of the real problem and hence uh, it it helps to focus on um helping them with customer identification and segmentation or how to really uh, conduct customer interviews at the problem solution fit stage uh, the lean startup and business modeling skill sets work very very uh, complement uh, as as very good complementary skill sets to really validate your um, solution in the real world and we see as you move from uh, stage 3 to stage 4 and 5 you might want to expand teams but that could be uh, very very specific to a particular solution 
and if if the idea is closer to your uh, company's current innovation core there might not be a lot of skilling uh, or new skills that you'll have to bring in but if it is something that is pretty disruptive from your current core business uh, at maybe your business is not so digital now you need those kind of skill sets in uh, the the new uh, program uh, the new product uh, that is coming out and then uh, lnd as well as um, the talent needs to be uh, looking at these skill sets separately uh, when we now finally coming to metrics so we look at three key metrics first is the input which is the kind of time and money that you've put into innovation next is pipeline what is the uh, um, intensity and conversion of the pipeline of the ideas across the different stages and lastly it is the outcome so how many uh, innovations have you really been able to implement and uh, what kind of impact is it on the uh, current business or is it on the future business how much is it going to sustain so when we look at uh, the input metrics, um, this is something that we keep investing in progressively. So as an idea starts to get validated, that is where we start to put in uh, more time. That is where leaders start to commit more and uh, more money comes in. And this just gradually keeps um, progressing from ideation to revenue and scale. Uh, when we talk about the pipeline metrics, it's important to look at two things. One is uh, what is the intensity of ideas or projects at any given stage, at any given point in time, and how are you, are you able to maintain that? And lastly, uh, we also have to look at the scale and the impact of the idea. Is it going to have a significant impact on cost? Uh, is it going to have a significant uh, impact on uh, uh, the a new market that you're going to enter? So those are some of the things that you need to look at. And... Yeah, so uh, those are um, th that's a little bit of a sneak peek into the building blocks of developing your innovation capabilities to uh, really become a company that has a culture of innovation. But uh, just to summarize uh, in a very very simple manner, what this um, what these building blocks and what this framework really does is that it lays a very very strong emphasis on value creation, so that the innovation teams start to become a lot more strategic, and they have these strategic business uh, partner uh, partnerships with the business. Uh, next, we are, um, you know, uh, we, we stress a lot on getting the right uh, stakeholder support and sponsorship because that really does increase the odds of uh, success. Uh, making multiple bets. So innovation cannot be one short, short bet. And we have to um, invest in multiple projects and try and test different things. Only once they're able to prove something to the customer, to the business, we go ahead and we invest a little bit more. Uh, the next is uh, you need to assess your capabilities. This is uh, the output and speed. Uh, and finally, uh, like we've been saying, we want to, uh, this is really about bottom up innovation and making that happen and using the collective intelligence of the organization. And that's where you need to give freedom, but you also need to be able to solve for risk. So uh, broadly, we focus on um, as, as recommendations that uh, most organizations would find helpful is first to have a very common uh, to develop a common language around innovation, because uh, it's important to measure innovation. It's important to make it very, very clear. But if you do not have that common language, then you don't know what to work towards. You don't know how to measure it uh, and so on. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is optimize the existing innovation spend. So it is important to keep looking at the different programs and how um, how effective they are being and if any kind of rethinking needs to be uh, done uh, to improve the way you're spending your resources and the kind of output that you're getting. 
the third thing is to build a case which makes innovation a differentiator for a particular business and that's really what um makes um it makes the partnership with business teams very very strong and lastly uh focus on building a virtuous cycle of value creation so when we talk about the state of innovation as a culture we want to uh, make sure innovation is very very scalable and teams across organizations are able to participate and create value so we hope uh, this presentation was useful and it gave you some uh, thinking points on what is it that uh, you could think about if um, if you want to have a better understanding of this model we can definitely have a separate conversation post the webinar uh, and now i would just like to call upon my colleague atit so that we could take some of the audience questions that have been coming in so yeah one of the questions that we which came in the chat uh, uh the question is this uh, we already have existing innovation program uh we don't think there is a problem in terms of the process but how do we think about increasing the participation from employees uh, how do we think about improving quality of ideas uh that's one of the questions which has come from the audience is in terms of how to convert it great so did you want me to take that yeah please please okay i can always add that okay great so with participation improving the quality of ideas uh, there are uh, two or three things that you know you need to focus on one is definitely the value proposition that is being uh, offered to employees and uh, if that is inviting enough uh, to get them to play a role um and uh with regard to the quality of ideas now the quality of ideas really depends on the kind of time that uh, teams have spent uh, understanding a problem uh so uh, some of the things that we highlighted is um you know helping them understand the customer's perspective have certain customer interviews and maybe even understand the business perspective or where the problems really lie so it's not about launching just a challenge and then uh, you know looking for solutions for that but also investing in the team to make uh, in in employees uh, to make sure they understand the context um, uh, quite a bit before they start to ideate um, so yeah that's that's one thing atit would you like to add i think that that's interesting uh, i think what i would maybe add to that is that uh, people have a natural inclination to participate in something which uh, they would be uh, you know successful with right uh, which is there and now the question becomes is what does that success really mean so there can be this whole element of rewards and recognition that we think about uh, but at the core what people want to see is either they get a no or why their idea was not selected to go forward and there's a reason and logic to it which allows them to sort of think through stuff second time they are applying for something or more critically if it is good then they want to see it sort of progress further uh, and that has its own gratification uh, and if you're able to build this cycle where enough number of ideas are steadily you know being taken into production they're taking into deployment or they're being invested enough before we say no to them uh, it just creates this real perception belief that hey you know my company does not only talk innovation they actually do innovation is not just an activity it's a real deal for us i have a real shot in succeeding if i do this so as soon as you associate innovation with something that is possible because the idea moves forward or doesn't move forward for valid reasons as soon as you start associating that with success the participation tends to increase you know um, automatically um uh, there's this interesting question uh, you know how is innovation different from research and development uh, you want to take that divya uh great so when we talk about uh, research and development is extremely uh, important and uh, is an input to innovation however innovation is really uh, the process of commercializing um, new ideas and taking them to market so uh when we look at an innovation uh process it it 
uh, it, it's very very linked uh, to business what you want to make sure is uh, not that you're developing certain uh, patents but you are trying to uh, get new revenue streams you're trying to improve the loyalty of your customers uh, and those are some of the uh, important things that you need to look at in terms of innovation Absolutely, I think uh, a good example here is iPhone. If you uh, if we look at iPhone's story and evolution, uh, what we find is that a lot of technologies that Apple ended up using to build the first iPhone were existing before the product itself. Uh, they ended up leveraging a lot of DARPA research in terms of you know bringing the touch screen together, bringing the the memory capacities, you know, solving for the battery life. But what Apple really did was convert that into something that people would use, and that's where they started to make that money. So there's a distinction between invention and innovation; both are equally important. Uh, but how we see it is it is innovation which is eventually adopted and used, um, and consequently, many a times you have small changes which have you know extremely high uh, impact on the business. Uh, a, a great example is in coding. Um, for for those of you who have been coding or lead software teams, uh, you would uh, appreciate uh, the 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 importance of a quality of a code, right? Which is to say, how lean the code it is, how clean the code it is. Uh, because if you do it right, you can save like a couple of milliseconds per step. Uh, and if you have a billion users, um, that just changes the workload on your system. That just changes the experience completely. Now, that's a very classic piece which can be categorized as innovation because the team would have written certain scripts to solve for it, uh, but you would not get a patent for it. But it has a material impact uh, on the business which is there. Uh, uh, we have this one question. You, you want to add something, Divya? Yeah. No, I was going to go with a question, but you can go. Yeah, so uh, maybe I can take this one. So there's this question in terms of uh, how do you think you can support Indian tractor company? Um, I think uh, innovation in terms of its first principles and in terms of its process does not really change uh, vis-a-vis -vis any industry. Uh, yes, what does change is how do you solve for certain things, right? So for example, if you're a software company, you want to do some sort of a customer, you know, uh, testing, you can do a, a web-based web -based A-B testing rather quickly because it's all software, people are online, uh, your customers are, so to say, uh, what we call as India 1, India 2 uh, piece, right? Um, and, and today, India 3, or which is to say the low, middle to low income group is something which is also able to sort of, you know, uh, has a lot more access to internet. Uh, that being said, compared that to with the hardware uh, component company, also you would have to sort of give a bit more time for that product to even come to a shape that you can take it to the customer uh, and a bit more time as you refine it. So your cycles are longer. But how you end up doing the custom interaction changes, uh, contextualizes, but the need for doing a customer search or the kind of questions you're asking does not really change. Or what you're really validating at that particular point in time of the journey does not really change. So in, in this construct of an Indian tractor company, um, I think uh, what someone like me would start with is something as simple as this. Uh, that tractors were brought in to increase the productivity and efficiency of the farm so that there is a higher revenue or higher savings or profitability of that particular farm. Um, in the Indian construct, we know it works in certain cases, it doesn't work in most cases. Uh, broadly, there are two main challenges in terms of the size of a land parcel, which does not make tractor ownership feasible. A uh, second part is that you don't even have enough money to own a tractor. So in this construct, how do you really solve from that simple aspect of increasing the profits or the savings for the farmer or the core customer, uh, which could be say a large agribusiness, which is there and start building from there in terms of what are the changes to be done. Um, I think we have seen some really interesting solutions out there. Uh, one of the companies that we, uh, we know of has been uh, installing these GPS devices um, and certain uh, telemetry devices in their tractors. And what they're really doing is they're creating a large data platform where they want to try and monetize this data uh, with, with buyers of agri products to be able to say that this is where the farming is really strong, this is where the farming is low, and things like that. So one can be creative depending on how we want to uh, you know, monetize. Uh, but I would start with something as simple as that is in terms of revenue first, uh, profitably next, and last is customer experience. Um, I'm saying customer experience last not to say that it's not important. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, especially in India, if it's going to save us money, if it's going to make us money, we don't mind a little bit of hardship. So uh, it has to have a very real value before I start talking about intangible. So that's how I would maybe think about opportunities and, and sort of, you know, go ahead. 
um can we have a more reference of good innovation case studies maybe through any other link write up and blog uh, I, I think you wrote something right Devi? i think we, we ended up publishing something or we have plans yes yeah, so we've written a blog on uh types of innovation um so what we can do is we have that uh, docket of case studies. Uh, so we'll be happy to post this call, share some of those innovation case studies. Um, and then, yes, if you're looking for a particular sector or particular construct in which you want to look for these case studies, uh, do drop us a line. Uh, uh, you have our email IDs. You can send us to on chat or you can you know, email Prashant. And we'll be happy to sort of, you know, uh, pull out some case studies specific to your context. Uh, so it just becomes a better read for the larger group uh, in the company. Okay, I think one last question, uh, and maybe you can take that. So what should we do if we are in a dilemma about an idea? Validate, uh, validate, validate, validate. I think um, uh, we were having this conversations just the other day. So much like everybody on this particular webinar, uh, we at Zeno are also constantly trying to figure out what next to sell, right? What is the new offering that uh, large corporates like yourselves would you know, end up paying us for? Um, and we had this you know, conversation or we have an internal program that we end up running to support teams. Um, and the emphasis that we were laying on was that uh, whenever you're building something for a customer, you have to constantly be in communication with them. Um, and you have to constantly keep validating everything that you know. It has to be taken as a hypothesis and assumption. Uh, the core point there was that every time we go and talk to a customer, the conversation changes. In the initial days, it's very, very focused on problem then it is focused on the kind of solution you want to build out. Then it is focused on kind of pricing you can do. And then you start solving for the repeatability of it and the scalability of it. Um, so you are constantly talking to the customer, but your questions are changing. What you're solving for is how to do that customer validation, so to say. The other important aspect of that in a large company is that uh, regardless of how many billions of profits we are making, uh, getting approval from finance or the boss man is never easy, right? Uh, in terms of the budgets. Um, and odds are, as soon as we provide a customer feedback or we provide any customer-led data, um, they become a lot more receptive of, you know, why that idea should be taken forward or not. Uh, there are a lot of mechanisms to do idea validation. Um, not everything requires us to constantly go and talk to all the customers out there. Uh, there are different hacks, there are different tactics that you can use, but that's where I would focus on, on the idea piece, uh, which is there. Great. So we have a few more questions coming in on the chat window. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure to sort of send this across to you as a small FAQ document that you can reference internally. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Um, uh, to, to wrap things up, uh, uh, we do believe that COVID-19 has brought to fore the importance of technology. It has brought to fore the importance of entrepreneurship. It has brought to fore the element of innovation. It has brought to fore the importance of agility and reacting things. Uh, the underlying scenario has been one of ambiguity, uncertainty, and extreme complexity. In such a construct, it becomes of paramount importance for us to think how will we respond quickly. Uh, we're not trying to predict here, and that's a very, very fundamental difference in innovation is that you're not really trying to predict where the world will go. Uh, you have a hypothesis, you validate it, but what you're really building as a muscle is to be able to monitor change and to be able to respond to that particular change in the most effective manner. Um, India has a great opportunity. Uh, we have one of the largest talent bases. We have the most diverse and attractive markets out there. Um, and simply put, anybody who has been able to build for India has been able to build for world. We have just more and more examples of companies uh, like Freshworks or Innovacer or Pubmatic or Inmobi in Startup World who are building from India for the global world. Um, we have examples of Khataburg. We have examples of um, a large steel companies trying to shift their models into B2C uh, construct in India. Um, so I think it's a very, very uh, intense time. Um, and innovation is going to be a central theme for anything we do. Um, it's important. Uh, we are super excited about it because we believe that is also key to our country's progress uh, and to for progress of each one of us. So any questions that you have, anything that you want to brainstorm on, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, as a, as a wrap-up to this particular session, just to confirm, we will be sharing uh, the presentation that Devia walked us through, uh, a fresh version of that. 
and we'll also be sharing a small FAQ document for you to look at. Um, otherwise, thank you so much. We're on top of the hour. I wish you all a wonderful day um, and see you soon. Bye-bye.